Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm Patrick McGowan. Uh, I work at University of Victoria. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of Public Health and Social Policy. I'm also the, uh, the Associate Director of Institute of Aging and Lifelong Health. And for the last 30 years, I've been implementing self-management programs into British Columbia. And I'm the uh, head of self-management British Columbia. Okay, now just one little comment is, when I'm doing this slide presentation, I usually don't look at the chat box because I don't want to interrupt the whole flow of the presentation. Just save your question till after afterwards when we have our question and answer period. Okay, so I'm going to put my slides up. There we go. Okay, so it's called Self-Management Programs Webinar. Okay, and uh, I was asked when, when I was speaking with... Uh, the administrators at Parkinson to cover a number of things. So what I'm going to touch on a little bit, just a little bit, <laughs> be the medical model of health, traditional patient education, who manages a health condition, acute versus chronic conditions, self-management and self-management support, what self-management addresses, how the group programs work, and how about the other programs we have besides the group programs, and then a little bit about self-efficacy. That's the main theory that's behind all these programs. And then I'll answer your questions, okay? So let, let's start. Here is the traditional medical model of health. This probably uh, lost favor in the 1950s or something. But remember, it was always emergency, emergency, uh, we had a wonderful system to detect. We saved people. You know, here's a river and people are drowning in the river and they're saying, how did they get here? Help me, help me. It's not my fault. What happened? I need help. And of course we have high tech machinery and gadgets like helicopters and boats and ambulance and everything else to get the people out of the hospital. And then we take them to the hospital where people are trying to fix them, okay? So Sorry that, to interrupt. Um, we couldn't see your slides. Are you sharing them? Yes, I am. Let me oh. take one more time. Yeah, I am. I'm sharing my slides. You can't see my slides, everybody? No? You still can't see them? No, I can't see them. Okay, hold on. I'll just call my tech person. <laughs> okay. Nada. Uh -huh. Oh, did did you share the screen with me? Yes, uh, you should be able to share your slide on your end. Um, okay. At the bottom there, you say, can say share screen, and then I don't know if you see it. Yeah, 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 and then choose from there. That's right here. Okay. Yeah. Can you see now? No, I still can't see it. Okay. Just a Shrink. little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You could put share there. Share. Yeah. There we go. Now it's good. You see him now. Wonderful. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, so okay, there we go. So there was the uh, the medical model of healthcare. Okay, now uh, when when people would take you to the uh, facilities and they try to fix you, uh, the traditional kind of patient education that was delivered sort of mostly dealt with the medicalized problem. Okay, you see for asthma, it was, well, how to use the inhaler properly, self-monitoring, environmental controls, diabetes, is injection of insulin, glucose monitoring, healthy eating, heart disease medication, all those types of things. Those are related to the medical condition. They call it patient education, but this was almost what the healthcare needed for us to do, okay? 
So uh, when you take a look at uh, the contributions or the determinants of health and their contribution, you see that uh, the medical contribution is only 10%, okay? whereas the behavioral contribution is 40%. So, so that means that the things that we can do for ourselves is four times more than just what the medical things can do for us. Okay, so so that sort of explains why self management is so important. Okay, so we have wonderful healthcare pro pro professionals. Okay, uh, you know, like for instance, a person when they're having trouble and whatnot, and let's say they're, you know, thinking, oh, oh do I have diabetes or something? The healthcare professionals are really, really good at diagnostics. You know, I'll give them five star, ding, 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 five stars, because they really could do. They do the blood test, they take a history, whatnot, and they tell us. But then they tell us what we should do. Okay. Uh, Patrick, you got to change the way you eat. You got to start exercising. You got to stop smoking. You got to go to Diabetes Education Center. And you just, just think that those words come out so easy at a health professional's mouths. You know, do this. You have to do this. Well, everybody knows how hard it is to change the way they eat. I mean, how do you do that? You know, what if you have a family? You know, what, what if you, you, your husband and wife and kids, kids want you to cook a certain way? How do you just change that? How do you start exercising? You know, the simplest thing in the world to stay healthy is just go walking. Why do people have so much trouble just going for a walk? Okay, so that, that was the sort of basic things that I used to say, you have to do this, tell, you know, when you're going out the office, change the way you eat, start, start exercising, smoking, okay. And so here, here's, we'll call him Patrick, you know, overweight, middle aged man. And, you know, when he has all these problems, he goes into the clinic, and they really do a good job. Remember, diagnostics are really good, do all the tests, whatnot, and they give them the scripts, the pills, and whatnot, and say, here you go, Patrick, off you go. Okay. And remember, you got to change the way you eat, got to start exercising, stop smoking, and you got to follow up in diabetes education. Okay. So, important things are uh, that clinicians, that means doctors, nurses, and they're only present for a small fraction of the time. Okay. You don't see them every day. You don't live in a doctor's office. You can't get to the doctors, and you even have trouble seeing a health professional now. You only see them as tiny little minute of the time. Okay. The second point is almost all outcomes are mediated through a person's own behavior. That means if I'm going to get better, if Patrick's going to get better, it's by what Patrick does himself, his own behavior. The third thing is motivation. Everybody thought, oh, if you can just motivation. But motivation is important, but it's not enough. Okay, you always hear if I can just motivate my son or my husband, my spouse, whatnot, but that's not enough. You have to have skills, you have to have abilities, other things go along too. And the last thing is chronic conditions are really different from acute conditions. I'll get into this in a second. Yeah. So, first of all, we hardly ever see a health professional. Now, this is a couple of years old, but still it's almost relevant today. So time managing at home over a year, okay? How many people, an average person sees a GP maybe one hour a year, you know, like because there may be three or four visits, 15 minutes of visit. So, and, and that's, it's not just a GP, that's all health professionals. Specialists, one hour. Then maybe PT, OT, dietitian, all the has 10 hours. So that makes a total of maybe 12 hours a year with professionals. So that means that an average person has 364 and a half days managing their health condition by themselves, or that's like 8,748 hours. So people manage by themselves. Healthcare professionals don't manage for them. Okay. So I said that chronic conditions are really different from acute conditions. Like an acute condition, like I mean, like a broken, broken bone, a cut, uh, appendicitis. Something happens really quickly. It happens fast. 
But a chronic condition takes time, sometimes years to develop. And then the cause of it, well, with acute condition, there's usually one cause. Okay? But for chronic conditions, there could be many causes. The duration of it with acute disease, it's sh short. You know, a, couple, a week or so, a couple of weeks, and then it's over. With a chronic condition, it's indefinite. It could last for life. And the diagnosis, you know, with, with acute conditions, health professionals are really, really quite good. But with chronic conditions, it's often uncertain, especially early on. You hear this all the time when people say, oh, I was so happy when they finally told me I had this condition. I've been worrying all these years what it was. Okay. And the tests that they use, well, uh, the tests they use in acute disease is really quite decisive. They're quite accurate. But they have limited value with chronic conditions. And in treatment, well, people get cured. Appendicitis, you know, into the hospital, they do an operation, a couple of days rest, and you're home. Okay. With chronic conditions, the cure is rare. And the role of a health profession, professional will be this person selects and conducts the therapy, the treatment, but the role with chronic condition is the health professional becomes a teacher and a partner with a participant. And the role of the patient here with acute decision, well, you do what they, you're told to do. You follow orders. But with a chronic condition, the person becomes a partner with health professionals, and that person is responsible for the daily management. So a big difference between acute disease and, and chronic disease. And I'm saying this because up until the 1950s, but not, we were really faced with acute diseases. You know, our whole system was built on acute disease. But then after that, chronic conditions came along as the population all increased. And a lot of the ways we did things in the past just don't work now. Okay. So here's a, a distinction, okay, in self-management. We're talking about self-management. And self-management refers to the behaviors that individuals engage in outside the healthcare context. That means what I do myself when I go home, when I live my life. Self-management support refers how individuals are supported by health professionals you know when because health professionals uh see people with chronic health conditions and the strategies that healthcare professionals can use are called self-management support strategies but what you and i do when we're living we're managing ourselves it's just called self-management so here's patrick again he gets his script you know you know stop smoking Eat, eat a proper diet, exercise, you know, find out more about diabetes education. And he goes out and, you know, outside, he's, you know, like he's out of the office now. He's in the real world. And you know something? The real world isn't always a nice place. Okay? Reality. It's not a nice place. And when you think of all the things that you have to do when you develop a chronic health conditions, I mean, you got to you got to recognize. You got to act on the symptoms. You got to make the most use of medications and treatments. You got to deal with the attacks and exacerbations. You got to eat properly for sure. You got to exercise. You got to give up smoking. You got to use stress management techniques. You you got to interact effectively with health professionals. You got to use community resources. You got to manage your work and the resources of employment services if you're not working. You got to manage your relationships with other people, and you got to manage their psychological response to your illness. So there's a lot to do there. Now, if I had a room of ten people, and uh, I'd say, "Okay, we're going to go around the, the, the room here, and uh, you're going to tell me what kind con of chronic condition you have, and uh, tell me the problems it's causing in your life." So the first person will say, well, I have uh, Parkinson's uh, disease and uh, it's causing blah, 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 blah. So I'd write down on the board the problems, not the condition. The person would maybe say other chronic health conditions as well. So after the 10 people are finished and you're finished going around the room, you probably heard maybe 50 different kind of chronic health conditions all in there. But you make a list of the problems that it's causing. 
Okay, this is what people are saying. These are the problems that it's causing. Getting up and down the stairs, going to the bathroom by myself, can't drive, you know, can't bathe or groom myself, cooking, feeling isolated and lonely, can't socialize with my other friends, struggling to keep up the work, just feeling unhealthy, tiredness, hard to travel, feeling bored, embarrassed because I'm drooling or shaking or, or trouble taking meds. So these are the things that self-management address, the problems that people say the condition has caused. It's not a medical program, like we're not going to provide medication and everything else, but we're going to help people learn the things they can do. Because remember what I said before, that almost all outcomes are mediated through a person's own behavior. And, you know, it's even more difficult today because the world we live in is not such a nice world, okay? Look, look, it's not a friendly place anymore. Think, think of this last couple of summers, okay? There's so many people with not enough income, homeless on the street, can't, can't find affordable housing, can't find affordable food to eat, extreme weather that we're having, can't get around because can't afford transportation, safety, either, either at their home or on the street, or even trouble talking to healthcare professionals, find enough to eat or maybe even having dental concerns. At the end of the year, taxation, no family support, the smoke from the forest fires, uh, just ability to deal with a pent up stress, personal care, and even cost of medications. These are even over and above the challenges. Okay? So it's hard if you have a chronic health conditions, but the point here is you gotta do a lot of things yourself as well, okay? So here's an overview of self-management programs. Now, the program I'm talking about now is the traditional one that's been around the longest. So we've had it about 30 years here in British Columbia. It's called the six session program. And people attended once a week for six weeks in a row for two and a half hours. And it's a group of 10 to 12 people. And it's led by two trained people, two volunteers. All of our programs here at Self Management C are delivered by volunteers. The person could have a good background, they could have a medical background, could be a doctor, could be a teacher or not. But when they do it, they do it the way that we teach them to do it, not as a health professional. So these programs for persons with any type of chronic health condition can be anything. It's self-referral. There's no gatekeeper. They just contact our, our website or online or whatnot, and they register. And their spouses or significant others can participate. And it's led by pairs of lay persons who have the chronic health conditions themselves because that's so important, the lived experience. And the leaders who lead it, they take a four-day training where they learn how to do it, okay? And the, the, the program itself, it follows a leader's manual because it was a lot, a lot of research was done at Stanford University many, many, many years ago. And if you do it properly, then you get the good results, okay? And so... It's almost like we have a license to use this as long as we use it properly the way it's supposed to be. And, you know, the course is given once a week for two and a half hours, 10 people there, the average size, 10 to 12. And everybody who takes a program gets a book because people want to read about it. It's a really nice book, Living a Healthy Level of Chronic Conditions. And if it was a program for pain, they'd get a pain book, you know, like, and uh, the program doesn't follow this, but people always want to read more about it. Okay. And there's no cost. There's no cost to people. Well, it does cost something, but the British Columbia Ministry of Health is paying for it. Okay, but for people, uh, there's no cost at all. We give the, we give our leaders, the two people who lead it, an honorarium. Maybe 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 seventy dollars after they lead the six session program, two and a half hours a week for six weeks in a row. <laughs> okay, and what do people learn in the program? Well, they they learn information. Okay, they learn information from, from the leaders that are leading it, and also for a little bit about reading book, but also they, lead, they learn from other people because other people describe things and there's vicarious learning. Okay, and the skills that they learn, they learn getting started skills. Like, how, how do you start exercising? You know, problem solving skills because you're going to be facing problems all the time. Okay. Communication skills, how to talk with people without getting into a big fight. You know, how do you talk to health professionals? You know, working with your healthcare professionals, dealing with anger, fear, frustration that are common things when you have a chronic health conditions, dealing with depression, dealing with fatigue, shortness of breath, 
and evaluating treatment options because you're always hearing left, right, and center that you should be trying this, try that, whatnot. And people with chronic conditions are very vulnerable or susceptible to that kind of advertising. And even some cognitive techniques like self-talk and relaxation techniques. These are the core things that are in the programs. Okay, so now in each of the programs, there's three or four core self-management strategies. And this one is called problem solving. Okay, And problem solving is because people are going to be experiencing problems their whole life. But they can't run to the doctor's office and say, tell me what to do. They have to figure out a way of, of solving the problem themselves. Okay, It's almost like on one of the islands out in the Georgia Strait, if there's an island and there's a man living on the island and he's really starving, like, what do you do? Do you go over there and you give him a fish to eat or do you teach him how to fish? The idea is you teach him how to fish because people will be experiencing these problems their whole life. So the steps in problem solving process, the person specifies what the problem is and the reason why they think the problem's there. Okay, and this person says, I'm having trouble sleeping at night uh, because the medications make my stomach hurt. Okay. See, it's important to say because, because it could be I'm having trouble sleeping at night because my neighbors party all night long, which is a completely different thing. You got to say what the problem is and what you think the cause of it. The second thing is list all the ideas that you think that might be able to solve the problem. Okay, for this one, well, uh, I can I can talk to my doctor. That's one idea. When I see him next time, uh, I can phone the, the nurse line, you know, and ask them about that. Well, I can see the pharmacist, you know, or there's somebody in my building who knows a lot about medications. I can ask them or I could look it up online. Okay, So then you look at all those ideas and you choose one to give a try. OK, so it's almost like do a pros and cons. So which one are you going to try? So this person says, well, I'm going to go and speak to the pharmacist. You can always speak to him. He's easy to understand and see what he thinks. So then I get an idea from there. And then you give the idea to try and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, you go back and look at one of the other ideas. Okay. And usually people are able to solve. And, and the sort of guideline is when, you, when you're trying to solve a problem, give yourself, I guess, a good two-week trial before you decide, no, it's not working for me. you got to try something else. Okay. So problem solving. Okay. And, you know, it, it can get really, really complicated too. Like, Here's a person, uh, this person says, I'm not changing the dressing regularly because I'm afraid I won't do it properly. Okay, this person had like massive bed sores, okay? So that's the first idea. See, I'm not changing it because, see, you say what it is and because what? So list the ideas that may solve the problem. So you don't, like our leaders don't give the ideas to the person. The person comes up with ideas themselves. Well, maybe I can do it and have the nurse watch me and give me some feedback. Or maybe just ask the nurse to show me how to do it again. Or maybe have the nurse check it a couple of times. Or maybe get written instructions. Or maybe have someone I can phone if I need help. Or maybe there's a video that shows it. Or maybe I'll get my partner, my buddy, to learn how to do it well. So the person thought of all the ideas and then selected one. So he's going to try getting his buddy to learn how to do it as well. So this, his buddy, his partner can help him. Okay, examples of problem solving. Okay. The problem solving process teaches a patient the process you can use to solve problems when they arrive in daily life. Because you need to be able to solve it. You can't go run into the doctor's office. And you know, in medicine, they have these things called levels of evidence. Like how strong is the evidence? Has it ever been shown? There are many, many studies, whatnot. And the highest level, the strongest evidence is 1A. So problem solving process is 1A. No. The second study I'm going to show you is making an action plan. People always want to do something like they, they get enthusiastic. Yeah, I'm going to go walking. Oh, yeah, I'm going to join and, you know, do exercise. I'm going to, I'm going to eat better and whatnot. But you, it's hard to get started and it's hard to maintain that behavior. So making an action plan. This is what it's called, action plans. So the plan has to be something that you want to do, not something that your partner wants you to do, your spouse wants you to do, something you want to do yourself. It has to be reasonable, you know, reasonable. Like a person, let's say if the person and he's maybe uh, 290 pounds, 
and he's really hasn't exercised at all. And he says, well, I'm going to go jogging. I'm going to go jogging for like uh, half an hour. Like, is that reasonable? So you'd ask the person, you know, well, when's the last time? Are you a jogger now? No, I'm not a jogger now. I can't go jogging. Oh, well, let's think about something that's reasonable for you to try. And it has to be behavior specific, you know, an action. And, it, and what the person comes up with has to answer the question, what are they going to do? How much are they going to do? When they're going to do it? And how often? Because there's, in this program here, there's seven days between each of the sessions. So how many days are you going to do that? Like, and, and the more clear you get with the person, the more clear they are. So they know if they've been or not. And then the last part of it is to say, on a scale of zero to 10, where zero means I don't have any confidence, I'm going to do that. And 10 is I'm 100% confident. How confident are you? And the person has to say seven, eight, nine, or 10, because all the research shows that when people have high confidence, they're going to do it, they usually do it. And person has low confidence, they don't do it. Okay. So even, even it doesn't have to be very sophisticated. Here's the goal right here. Someone wants to, to, ex to achieve in three to six months. Goals are something you achieve in three to six months. Action plan is a short little baby step. Okay. So the person says, uh, I, I want to be, my goal would be to be exercising regularly, maybe about five hours a week, you know, like I think that would be good. And then the action plan is the small little doable step that you're going to take towards starting on that goal. So between this week and next week, I'm going to buy a pair of running shoes. You know, of course, the person can't start running or jogging or anything else without any shoes. And then you say, what's the confidence level you're going to do that? So they say, well, zero to 10 there. They're about eight confidence. So great. And then in the next session, a person always reports back how they made out. That's really important about action plan. You always have to report back because without the reporting back, then it's like just not very effective. Okay. So, and even the principle, when a person uh, hears themselves in front of others saying something, it's much more powerful than for them to actually complete it. So that their own beliefs are more influenced by what they hear themselves say than what others say to them. Okay. And usually over the years, I've tried to, like I said, we've been doing this for about 30 years. People in these programs, no matter what kind of chronic health condition they have, all the way from, you know, diabetes to cancer to any kind of condition, it's always something to do with exercising or eating or, or medically related, like, like seeing somebody, like getting something looked at or something. Okay, or personal emotional or related to release of stress. Okay, these main categories, especially one, two, and three. Okay, okay. so the programs that we have available uh, would be the chronic condition self management program, and that's a program for any for any for a person experiencing any type of chronic health condition, no matter what. Okay, because everything is applicable to all chronic health conditions. And we have those available in English, in Chinese, and in Punjabi. Okay, that means that we've recruited and trained Chinese leaders. We've translated all the information into Chinese, and the programs delivered in Chinese to Chinese people. And the same with Punjabi. Okay. And a lot of these could, are virtual, and a lot of these are in, per, uh, in person. Because with COVID, we had to change all our program to virtual. And, you know, that was a big, big uh, question whether people would come of it, but they did. Okay. Then we have this other program called the Chronic Pain Self-Management Program, and we have that one only in English. We haven't been able to get the resources and time and for the effort and everything to change that into different languages. Then we have the Diabetes Self-Management Program, which we're delivering in English, Punjabi, Chinese, and in indigenous communities. Okay. And again, that could be in-person program or virtually. You know, virtually people just stay at home in front of their computers and participate in the six sessions that way. And then we have another program called Thriving and Surviving Cancer Self-Management Program. And that's in English. So people would just go to our website and uh, look at the program and put their name and register the program. And then we would contact you. So, okay, you've registered for a program. The program is starting on this date, as you saw on the website. Uh, here is the book you'll need, and here's where it's located, and off you go. Good luck. And, and the coordinator for the whole area will be John. Okay. So that's the group programs, 
which are in-person or virtual. Okay. Now, when the leaders lead the program, they follow this leader manual. Okay, only the leaders have this. Okay, so here's just sort of a symbol like it's a group of 10 people or eight people here and the two leaders are leading. And all they use is a flip chart. There's no uh, PowerPoints, no technology, whatnot. It's just a flip chart. Really simple. It can be done anywhere. And everybody who participates gets either this book right here, Living a Healthy Life with Chronic Conditions, and or if they're experiencing chronic pain, Living a Healthy Life with Chronic Pain. Okay, the information about cancer and diabetes and everything else is in this book right here. Okay, um, and over the years, what people who've come forward and volunteer, like I think in total, we've trained about eight thousand people to become volunteers and lead these programs. And volunteers always do it together. And if you just look at some of the people volunteers, of course, a lot more females than male uh, become volunteers, but that's sort of the way it is in healthcare and teaching and whatnot, okay? Uh, here's here's one, another slide I just, I think this was in Kimberly or something. And look at, look at the people who are, who've come forward and wanted to learn how to lead a program in their community. And we notice a, a lot of people who have nursing backgrounds like to do it. Like teachers and nurses, but they're people with all sorts of skill sets. Okay. And uh, here it is like here's a program we've done in, in Vancouver one, once. And you see this uh, diversity of people, young and old, and different nationalities. And that's all it is is a flip chart up front with the leaders leading the course. Okay. No technology. Okay. Even this is way up in. Uh, King Kulith, I think it's called now. That was no, formerly known as King Kulith in the, uh, I think, uh, Nishka territories, where we have two elders who were trained, received the training, and they're leading the program to people in their community. And that's really, really powerful because, first of all, it's a powerful program and people are coming out. And secondly, because the two leaders are, are, are elders in the community. So people listen. And, uh, you know, like, as I say, a lot of sharing, a lot of learning takes place in a program, especially vicarious learning. People share ideas, like if they had that problem, this is what some of the things they tried and what worked and what didn't work. And even we have the program going on in sort of South Asian communities. And it's really, really quite funny because they told us right at the beginning, oh, men and women can't be in the same room. No siree, you know, it's completely different. But we've been all over British Columbia with, uh, implementing the programs in South Asian communities. And there was just one example, one place, a really, really strict group. They put up a wall in the middle and all the women sat on one side and all the men sat on the other side. But that's the only other case. You can see that people do interact with each other. Okay. Now, those are the six session programs if people want to invest once a week for six weeks in a row. Now, because British Columbia is different and everybody wants a different thing, we can't just offer one thing on the menu. We have to, uh, we have to offer several things that are implemented differently. So the first one, and that's the simplest one, is a toolkit program. And this is for people who, who don't want to have anything to do with the healthcare system. Maybe they've had bad experiences with teachers. Maybe they've had bad experiences with people in authority or healthcare professionals, and they just want to do it themselves. Just send me information. I'll read it myself. So we have a thing called the toolkit program. We have the toolkit program for chronic conditions, for chronic pain and diabetes. And we have it in English and Punjabi. So people get a little smaller book, which they read. And it says, okay, now here's a little questionnaire for you. How, were you having trouble with not? And, and, and then it refers to the information that's in the bigger book I showed you. So people do it themselves. And every single year, we have about maybe 2,000 people that want this program all over the province. Okay. Then the second one, which is even different, is called the Online Better Choices, Better Health Program. And that's where people sit at their computers and they enroll in a program that's being done by two leaders, but on the computer, itself, you know, and um, it's again, the same self-management program, 
chronic condition self-management program that you would take in person, but you're doing it at your own pace. It's asynchronous. I mean, you go on and you do as much as you want at one time. So Sunday night, if you can't, you can't sleep, you get up, you can go to the computer at midnight and go on and do a couple of hours if you want, or an hour or something. But again, it's a six session program and we're able to offer it in English only so far. Then, see, see that's that's by your own computer. This is just all by yourself. You know, no involvement in anybody else. This is online. You don't know who the computer is. Everybody has a screen name, so there's no identification with them. Then we have this program called the Health Coach Program. And we implemented that program here about maybe six or seven years ago. And this is, we have all these people who are trained leaders and we train them to become coaches. And people just want to, don't want to participate, come up to something. They just want some by phone. So we match up the person who has a problem and, wanna, and wants a coach to a participant. So a fem female with a female and a male with a male. And for 13 weeks, the coach will phone that person and right away say, well, how's it going with the diabetes today, Patrick? Because, you know, the person gets to know me a bit. And how's the medication, everything else? What about life? How's the family, everything else? And then if I identify any problem, the coach will encourage me to use the problem-solving process and identify something I can do and come up with an action plan. Okay, every single session. So that that we have about 400 or five, five, 450 people a year that participate in this 13 week program. And then we have another similar program called the Frailty Health Coach Program. And this is for people who want to slow down or prevent progression towards frailty. Because frailty with older people isn't inevitable. You can do something about it. And right now we're, we're doing actually a study with the federal government, seeing the effectiveness of our frailty program. But that works the same way by telephone once a week for 13 weeks, okay? And then the last program is the Community Lifestyle Diabetes Program. And this is for uh, people who uh, believe that they're gonna develop type two diabetes. And when you develop type two diabetes, you're in for a whole life lifetime of, of hurt, okay? And this program, the, the prevention program was developed in the United States for the Center of Disease Control, and that was very, very powerful. It prevented people from becoming diabetic, having type two diabetes, prevented people from having all these terrible things that go along with like heart problems, strokes, and everything else. And the program was implemented and it's a full blast down there. And then the program was implemented in England and had the same results. And we're implementing the program here right now. We're in our implementation process of getting that program started. And that program lasts a whole year, would you believe? So for the six, for the first six months, there's 16 one-hour sessions. And then after that, like twice a month. And again, it's led by two volunteers who get trained how to do it. So you see, we have the the one where you have to be with a group of people for six weeks in a row, and either that's in person or by Zoom and the different kinds. Then we have this one that you do it all by yourself. Nobody's going to involve you and you, you don't have to count to anybody. And then this one by yourself, but on the computer, this one by telephone, this one by telephone, and this one again by Zoom. Okay. So we we have to have an opportunity for people to get into the program because in British Columbia, we have our uh, person and family-centered care philosophy. And with that, what's implicit in that is that the people have, a uh, have the right to take as much health education as they want. It's not up to health professionals. So sometimes people, after they finish one program, they take another program. We usually try not to have people taking two programs at the same time because they get mixed up of what they're supposed to do, okay? So the core self-management skills in these programs are problem solving, which I just uh, demonstrated. Uh, taking action, which is the making action plan, using resources and, and developing good provider resources. But there's one more too, is decision-making, okay? And decision-making, it's, it, it's really uh, something that happens to people when you have all sorts of chronic health conditions. and 
it works in, with people experiencing different kinds of chronic health conditions. Here's one, a person who's experiencing cancer, okay? Now just read it, okay? So Nigel is 49 years old. He's divorced male and he has two teenage children with shared custody and has metastatic colorectal cancer. He's just returned to work as a civil engineer. When you ask him how he's doing today, he gives you a detailed description about how he's not feeling well with all, with, at all. He states, I can't handle the stress. I'm not sleeping. I'm worried all the time about my latest scan results, which I'll get my appoint at my appointment next week. I know I'm supposed to be taking the antidepressants I was prescribed, but I don't think they're helping. I just can't cope with how terrible I feel. My emotions are all over the place. And he sounds like he's struggling not to cry on the phone. He's not been following the doctor's recommendations regarding the antidepressants. And my doctor told me I should try to get exercise, but it helps because it helps depression and I feel stronger. But, but I'll be able to do that if my scan isn't that bad. I know it'll help, but I'm just too tired. He says he knows his situation is also having an effect on his children. Lastly, he tells you that he has had a discussion with his boss who thinks he should consider taking sick time until he can get everything in order. But the decision needed to be his. He realizes he needs to consider his boss's suggestions here. So what does he do? Now, what does he do? Like a difficult decision. Does he, does he take time off work or sick? What's the pros and cons of it? So the strategy we use in self-management is a person comes up with a list of, of pros, sort of things that would encourage you to do it, and cons. So the thing that he thought of would be in the pros, the reason why he should, is I just can't keep everything together. And for each one of these, he gives it a number. Five is really, really important to them. And one is, well, it's there, but it's not that important. It's hard to concentrate at work, but that's important for my kids are feeling the stress and really important. Five. I'm just so tired. I can't get a good night's sleep. Five important. My colleagues at work see me in this terrible shape. Three. And then maybe I'll have time to exercise. Three. So the reasons why he think he should take the time off would be a total of 25. And see, he scores these himself, how important they are to him. But then at the same time, he thinks of the reasons why he shouldn't take time off. Well, work keeps me preoccupied and I'm not worrying all the time. So that's a four. And I want to keep the regular income coming in, which is important, five. Uh, I worry it might jeopardize my job status. That's a five. It'll make my kids worry, four. In my family, we're all strong individuals. So that's three. And I don't know what I'll do all day long, three. So then he adds up these and it totals 24. So all the things he thought of that he should take the time off, total 25, and all the things that he shouldn't take, 24. But then what he does is he says, what does my gut tell me? What does my gut, gut feeling, a gut's right down in your belly and just above your belly button there. Where does my gut feeling? And he says, my gut feeling tells me I should take the time off work. Okay. So this, this is a hard, like people, you know, especially in some conditions, you know, they, the doctor says, well, do you want to take this pill or that pill? Because we really don't know. It's, it's up to you. So you got to go through this whole thing again. And especially serious conditions, like an example, he's in cancer here, you know, like, well, you have 25% getting better, 30% not getting better. And it's, it's hard to make these decisions. It's even hard if you're going to buy a new car, like looking at, uh, should you get a, uh, should you get a, Toyota rather than a um, Honda, you know, the pros and cons. In this way, you're looking at everything as factually as you can, and secondly, as emotionally as you can, and you always do what your gut tells you to do. So in this case, he says, I'm going to take the time off work. So that's a really important strategy. And again, the level of evidence is 1A, strongest evidence in the world. Okay? So just to sort of finish up a little bit, all these programs are based on self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is defined as the belief that you can perform a specific behavior or task in the future, okay? 
And it comes from a Canadian, Dr. Albert Bandura. He lived just north of Edmonton for many years before he went to Stanford University. And it's so important. It affects every phase of health behavior change. It will help influence whether you even consider making a behavior change, how much you'll benefit from the behavior change, how well you'll maintain the change you've made, and how vulnerable you'll be to relapse. So it's a powerful theory. And uh, you, you know, like sometimes you hear about programs that are that don't have any theory at all. They just people say, oh, you should do this, you should change. Like there's no rational why A leads to B. But this program has been around for many years. Uh, it's around 25 countries in the world implemented. Uh, and it has tons and tons and tons of publications. If you just go to Google and self-management of this self-management that you'll read all the strong research, okay? So if a person in British Columbia wants to take any of these programs, you just go to selfmanagementbc.ca. It's selfmanagementbc.ca. See the website up on the top there, selfmanagementbc.ca. And you can register for any program. You can see what's available, the different programs. And you can register for the one you want because they have different starting dates. And you can register for one that's by virtual or by in or in person. Okay. So I think I'll end right there. And uh, maybe if anybody has a question or two that we can address. Stop share, stop share. Okay. There we go. Okay, um, we have a comment here. So it says, I am confused about the objectives of this session. I thought it was going to be how to self-manage with PD, but it seems to be creating awareness about the self-management option out there and why we need to do SM. Well, when, when, uh, the self-management strategies you can use, you can use it with Parkinson's, you can do it with diabetes, you can do it with cancer, you can do it any kind of chronic, chronic health deficit. Those, those techniques are universal, okay? Well, th this isn't just for one chronic health condition or anything else, okay? Like I tried to explain here, these, these strategies and these programs help with any kind of chronic health conditions. That's what I did when I made the, the list of the, the problems people are having in their life. Remember when, when you start off the program, you go through that process? Those are the common problems that you go from one side of Canada to the next, no matter what kind of chronic health condition. But it doesn't focus on the medical chronic condition. It focuses on the problems you have managing your chronic condition. That's the difference, I guess. I hope that explains it. It's just out of interest, the same self-management strategies have been implemented in people who have just developed cancer and are going for treatment, okay? Which is different from a person who just developed diabetes or a person who has arthritis, you know? You know, like there's about 700 different kinds of cancer. So any of those strategies or like 125 different types of, of uh, arthritis, they're all appropriate for any kind of chronic health condition. Like it's not a medical, your health professionals will do the medical things. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to continue this a little bit. Uh, many, many, many years ago, I was working with the Arthritis Center in Vancouver. And uh, I would see people come into the center getting treatment year after year after year after year. And I would notice just the gradual decline of the person's ability. Okay. And people would say, it's like, well, what can we do? What can we do? And the only role that people had was to fundraise. You know, fundraise, because then, then we'll take care of you, you know, like that medical thing. We'll take care of you, fundraise. And people say, can't we do anything ourselves to help ourselves? And that's when we started implementing self-management because it's for people to help themselves. We have one here. Do you see the C success in most people that do these courses? Yes. 
And uh, if you if you if you're a person that goes to the library and looks up research journals whatnot, there is more research done in self management than almost in any other kind of intervention. And it's probably one of the most powerful programs that exists in the world. So, yes, first of all, all over the world, like as I said, it's in 25 different countries. And uh, you always see where people make improvements. Improvements. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, when I went to China, okay, the massive population of China, the way it was, the reason why I was invited there is because I think it was like 80, 85% of all healthcare was delivered in a hospital. And they wanted programs to be delivered. They wanted to change that in the next 10 years to about 50% of all care being done at home in the community and only half in the hospital. And we implemented the program there. And uh, uh, a couple of years later, I read a journal article from the World Health Organization that 1.5 million people in Shanghai had taken the program already. And it had even good results with, with uh, congestive heart failure. You know, that one. So anyways, the, the simple answer is you'll find more evidence of effectiveness with this program than any other program around. But that's why the Ministry of British Columbia is funding funding these programs, because because you have evidence. You wouldn't do it if there's no evidence. I guess just to reiterate, is there like a requirement to join these programs, or you just apply for it? All you do is either phone our office. There's a phone number on the website, or you go online and you just fill it out and you've joined. There's no requirements. It's up to you, it's up to the person. There's no gatekeeper. Like it won't take a health professional and say, okay, no, you're not gonna take the program. We'll let you take the program. You can take the program if you want. All right, I guess that answers how you could get started. So you just call the office. Yeah, um, you just go to the website and look at the different programs, the little descriptions, and any questions, phone up and you'll have someone who explain it even better. You know, if you like a lot of people say, well, I can't take a program right now, but I will in, in, in February. Will there be a program? So the person will be able to answer that question, you know. And if we haven't got a program set up already, we'll put your name on a list and call you when one's set up. I have another question here. What type of SM program are available for PD patients? Well, for Parkinson's disease, a person yep. experiencing Parkinson's disease. Okay. Well, you, you wouldn't want the pain one unless you're experiencing pain. Okay. Probably the chronic conditions one, the chronic conditions six session program, because it's applicable. Uh, any of the, the health coach program would be a perfect one. Um, and and even, even the online chronic conditions one. Or you, you, you do it on yourself, computer asynchronously, any of those. You know, what, what you do is you think of the symptoms, you think of the problems you're having and what the program's going to help you about. Not, oh, that's unique to Parkinson's disease or that's unique to cancer or whatnot and so it won't work. It does work, okay? Okay, we have a comment here. I found the webinar very informative and well presented. Thank you. That's from Sylvia. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, another question. Sharing experiences is powerful. What about professionals sharing experiences or of useful self management tips? Okay, so yeah, sharing experiences take place in all the peer programs, all the, all the people who take the programs, they share experiences because they learn from each other. Uh, now, I don't know about professionals sharing experiences. Uh, over the years, we've, we've attempted, and still, we're still programs to train health professionals to use self-management support strategies. Remember the distinction between self-management support? That's what people do themselves. 
but then health professionals who are treating people, there's some techniques too that promote people to, to be more engaged themselves. And we've, we've, we've provided trainings to all over British Columbia to healthcare professionals. I mean, doctors, nurses, I mean, nurses have standards, best practice guidelines. We've done them for physiotherapists, respirologists and whatnot. But we just don't have an indication of how well health professionals are using them on an ongoing basis. It's been, they've been, there's been training available for many, many years in British Columbia for people to learn them. It could be that maybe it's just impossible for doctors to use self-management strategies because they only have like, like 12 minutes a person and they can't get into that. They haven't got time, okay? But for maybe a nurse, a public health nurse or a physiotherapist, you know, the distinction there is either tell a person the things that you've done that you learned in university that they should be doing, exercise, anything else, or get into this other soft stuff that's considered, you know? So it's a challenge. But I know that a lot of people are actually doing it, you know? Great. Um, yeah, and that concludes our webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. McGowan, for attending and presenting. Good. My pleasure. Informative. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye now. Bye.